Hello and welcome to our presentation titled Sequential Monte Carlo Introduction and Diagnostics. Here I'll be giving a brief introduction to Sequential Monte Carlo Samplers or SMC for short and the steps we've been taking to try and improve the implementation into PyMC3. So no prior knowledge of SMC samplers will be required. First, we would like to thank the organizers of the PyMCon 2020 for taking the time to pull this together and giving us a chance to expose our work. Here is an outline of the presentation with some timestamps, so you can skip ahead if you so wish. Allow me to introduce us. I'm Pedro on the left side picture. I come from the field of biophysics and recently completed my PhD. My thesis was centered around the use of statistical mechanics to simulate and study systems of biological interest. And currently I'm doing my postdoc alongside Osvaldo, here on the right side picture. He's one of the core developers of PyMC and Arvis. Financial support for this work has been provided by the non-profit organization NANFOCUS and CONICET, the Argentinian Science and Technical Research Council. Alright, first let me clarify what we refer to when we talk about SMC, as there has been some noise regarding this term. Since similar methods have emerged from different fields of research, it's not uncommon for other names to be used. And at the same time, for very similar methods, different names can be found in literature. So we can say that SMC algorithms are a broad family of sampling methods that share some common characteristics. This being that firstly, a tempered target distribution is sampled. Then this sample's possibility weights are calculated. These weights are then used to resample the tempered distribution while decreasing the tempering factor, and this process is repeated until the tempering factor is zero, at which point we have sampled the target distribution. Here I'll focus on the PyMC3 implementation and its usefulness for Bayesian statistics. And now I'll give an overview about how each of these steps have been implemented into PyMC3. One of the key differences between SMC and other sampling methods is the introduction of tempering. This is used to smooth out the target distribution in order to improve the sampling. This idea has been borrowed from mechanical statistics, where the number of accessible energy states of a physical system is determined by its temperature. The intuitive way to introduce this concept into Bayesian statistics is to add a tempering factor into base equation. Here it's denoted with the Greek letter beta. This way, when beta is zero, we'll be effectively sampling from the prior distribution, as is shown in the right side picture. As we increase beta, we'll be sampling from distributions that are closer and closer to our posterior. After the last stage is completed, where beta is one, will be left with a set of samples from the posterior distribution. This way, progressively decreasing the tempering factor can be very helpful in sampling multimodal distributions, where one of the modes may be missed by other sampling methods. Here we have a schematic representation of how the sampling algorithm would progress. At stage zero, as we mentioned, we sample from the prior distribution. These samples from the prior are obtained randomly. Then the possibility weights are calculated and these weights are used to resample the distribution in the following stage. How this is implemented into PyMC3 is that each of the samples will spawn a number of samples for the next stage according to its possibility weights. Just like we can see in the picture here, where those samples that have fallen in regions of low probability will be discontinued. Those that are in regions of high probability 
will multiply. And thus, this region of high probability will be continuously sampled in the following stages. Then, these spawn samples are randomly perturbated by a sampling algorithm such as Metropolis Hastings before the tempering factor is adjusted and the samples are reweighted once again starting a new stage. We want to make clear that the SMC algorithm is not set in stone. There are in fact a lot of moving parts that can be tweaked and tweaking this may or may not improve the sampling. To name a few, we have the method by which the tempering factor is adjusted. The PyMC3 implementation adjusts the tempering factor in such a way that the effective sample size equals some predefined value. But other methods of adjusting this tempering factor have been proposed in literature. There are also multiple ways the resampling step can be implemented. To calculate the number of sampling particles that will be spawned from the original particles, PyMC3 currently uses the naive approach, which is that this number is calculated from a multinomial distribution that's based on the original particles' plausibility weights. But there are other possibilities, like the ones presented in the recently published paper by Lee and others, in which they focus in optimizing this step of SMC. Another critical component of SMC is the sampling algorithm used to produce the random permutations after the resampling step. This is called the kernel, and some of the algorithms that can be used here are Metropolis Hastings, independent Metropolis Hastings that has been recently implemented into PyMC3, or gradient-based methods such as Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. Moreover, the kernel parameters can also affect the performance of SMC. The number of steps the kernel is run for and its proposal distribution will affect the sampling. As we've seen, there are a lot of movable parts that can be optimized. Now, let's go over some of the advantages that SMC can have over some of the other common sampling methods. One of the main ones is the advantage when sampling multimodal posteriors. Since we are sampling from the smoothed out tempered posterior, we have a better chance of jumping between the modes of the distribution. Whereas other sampling methods may have a very low probability of jumping between the modes, and thus make a stack in one of these and only sample that particular mode. Another upside is that we obtain the marginal likelihood as a byproduct of running SMC. While most of the time we discard the sample weights we obtain from sampling the temper posterior, these can be used to calculate the marginal likelihood if we are looking to do Bayesian model comparison, for example. And this will come at no additional computational cost. Moreover, modern software like TensorFlow, TensorFlow Probability, or PyMC4 can allow for the sampling of multiple chains in parallel with little extra computational cost. In this regard, methods such as SMC that are built from the ground up to be run in parallel can benefit from this. It is also the base for SMC ABC, a method for approximate Bayesian computation, or in general simulation-based inference, where calculating the likelihood is not always available. We also have to talk about some of the problems with SMC. Like with most sampling methods, sampling at high dimensions can be problematic. Complex distribution shapes can also pose a problem. Also, the literature regarding the proper diagnostics of SMC seems to be rather lacking. This is a problem when trying to measure the performance of a sampler, which is a crucial step in its optimization. For this reason, the next part of the presentation will focus on the diagnostics we've been using to evaluate different versions of SMC under various conditions. Moving into the diagnostics, what we want to answer is how can we know we had a good sample of the posterior? For this, we'll look at different diagnostic metrics, such as the error score, R hat and ESS diagnostics, and the distribution of last stage original indexes. To run this test, we've used two different models. 
One that's a mixture of two n-dimensional Gaussians and another of a hierarchical model using the radon contamination dataset. Both of these are used as examples in the PyMC3 documentation. If we know the target distribution we're trying to sample, what we can do is to formulate an error score. Then we can calculate this error score from the set of samples and this should give us an easy to visualize measure of the accuracy of the sampling. Of course, this can only be applied when we know for certain what's the target distribution we're trying to sample, so this can only be used in test cases. In the picture, we have plotted the error score for the mixture of two Gaussians model. As can be seen by the orange color line, this increase can be somewhat mitigated by increasing the draws parameter. These are the number of samples obtained from each individual chain of SMC. We use the error score to have a standard to which we can compare the other diagnostic methods to. This way we can know if other diagnostic methods that don't require prior knowledge of the target distribution are actually detecting a deficient sampling. The results shown here were obtained using the Metropolis Hastings kernel. In the next slides we'll compare this kernel with the recently implemented independent Metropolis Hastings. For the proposal, both of these kernels use a multivariate Gaussian with the covariance computed from the samples in the previous stage. The difference is that for Metropolis Hastings, the covariance is re-escalated based on the acceptance rate of the previous stage and the proposal is centered on the previous sample value. Whereas for independent Metropolis Hastings, the proposal is centered in the mean of the samples from the previous stage. This makes it independent from the previously accepted or rejected step. This means that the proposal distribution of Metropolis Hastings is affected by the local space that's being sampled. While for independent Metropolis Hastings, the proposal distribution is more global. One of the commonly used convergence diagnostics used for Markov chain Monte Carlo methods is R hat. This can be calculated using this equation where B hat is the posterior variance calculated by pulling all the chains and W is the within chain variance. When this coefficient is close to 1, it indicates a good mixing of the chains, which is a necessary but not sufficient condition for convergence. As a rule of thumb, this value should be below 1.05. By default, the PyMC3 implementation of SMC runs two chains, so these are used to calculate the within and between chain variance. When we look at the R hat when run with the Metropolis Hastings kernel, we can see that it increases at higher dimensions. This can be somewhat remediated by increasing the number of draws as can be seen in the orange color line. This is consistent with what the error score shows. On the other hand, we can see on the right side picture that for the independent Metropolis Hastings kernel, R hat indicates a good convergence. Another useful diagnostic is the effective sample size, or ESS for short. In a few words, the ESS of a given set of samples is the number of independent samples that would have the same estimation power as these samples. It is calculated by looking at the allo correlation within the samples. Ideally, when we divide the ESS by the total number of samples n, this number should be close to 1. It should be noted that this number can also go above 1, commonly when using nuts. When analyzing the samples from the Metropolis Hastings kernel, we can see that this metric falls sharply around dimension 20, which is consistent with what we saw with our hat. For the independent Metropolis Hastings kernel, we can see that this metric stays constant at around 1 even for greater dimensions. We also run SMC with both of these kernels on the hierarchical model built from the Radon dataset. When plotting R hat as a function of draws, we can see that for the independent Metropolis Hastings kernel, R hat falls sharply and beyond 4000 draws R hat approaches 1. On the other hand, the Metropolis Hastings kernel 
had a poorer performance with this diagnostic. When we look at the effective sample size, we see a similar picture, where the independent Metropolis Hastings kernel approaches 1 when the draws increase. While the effective sample size of the Metropolis Hastings kernel stays close to 0. With these results, we can say that both ARHAT and ESS are useful tools when diagnosing SMC. Another experimental diagnostic we've been looking into consists in tracking the ascendancy of the samples. As we can see here, in any given stage, each of its samples is a descendant of a sample from the previous stage. This means that by giving each original sample an index and keeping track of where each sample originated from at each stage, we can generate an ascendancy tree. Then we can know from which one of the original samples did any of the last stage samples originate from. In the right side picture, we have plotted how many of the original indexes are present in the last stage as a function of dimension. We can see that the diversity of original indexes falls sharply as the dimension increases. This falling diversity could indicate that something's awry about the sampling. Moreover, if the diversity falls below a given threshold at any stage, an early warning could be given to the user while the sampler is running. With this said, it is clear that still more testing needs to be done to establish how robust this diagnostic is. Well, now for the conclusions and ending remarks. We can say that SMC is a promising sampler for Bayesian inference, especially when we can expect a multimodal posterior. Modern computational frameworks should help with its performance too. Still, SMC isn't infallible. The sampling can go wrong at higher dimensions or with complex posterior geometries. For this, it's a good idea to keep an eye on the diagnostics. In this regard, we have seen that ESS and RHAT can both be valid in assessing the sampling. Another important thing when doing SMC sampling is the choice of the kernel. As we've seen, this can have a major impact on the sampling performance. Some of the future work that's left to do includes implementing user warnings when SMC diagnostics indicate a bad sampling, taking advantage of the JAX linker for Theano PyMC to execute multiple chains in parallel more efficiently. Exploring SMC with the Hamiltonian Monte Carlo or NATS kernel. Here, Jumpeng has already written an implementation in TensorFlow probability. Lastly, the implemented methods need to be tested for both accuracy and computational performance to see what kind of trade-off they bring to the table. In this presentation, we've gone over a brief introduction of SMC and some of the diagnostic methods we can apply to ensure its proper functioning. For a concrete application of SMC, you can check out our colleague Agustina's lecture. Alright, this is the end. Let me thank again the organizers of the conference, also an focus for the financial support, and to you for listening. We'll see you in the Q&A session.